Today on 219 West, when she was 11, she was abducted by a pimp. Now she's trying to put her life back together. Also, pop culture pimping. Why are pimps portrayed as successful and glamorous in movies and music? And doggone bedbugs. How man's best friend is sniffing out man's newest nuisance. Hello and welcome to this month's edition of 219 West, the monthly news magazine produced by the students of the CUNY Graduate School of Journalism for CUNY TV. I'm Walter Smith Randolph. And I'm Jessica Cordemalsh. In a few minutes, we'll be talking to Daily Beast columnist Peter Beinart about this year's midterm elections. And later on, we look at an ancient celebration from Ethiopia's Jewish community that is being celebrated for the first time right here in New York City. But first, trafficking America's children. Human trafficking. Usually when we hear those words, we think of women being smuggled in from other countries and forced into the legal sex trade, not the girl next door. A Bronx woman told Teresa Tomasoni her story. 22-year-old Samantha Wigan was 11 when she was kidnapped by a pimp. I heard him. He was like, oh, what you walking around for? And I just kept on walking, but he's, he's still following me, following me. Somebody came around from the other side and grabbed me and put me in. And it was about all together, one, two, three. I was like the fifth girl in the car. His name was Hooligan, also known as the babysitter. The reason why they call him that is because he'll take any girls, any age, it doesn't matter. You could have been nine, he's taking you. He told her she had a choice. She could stay or go. But if I had a choice, why you couldn't just tell me this from when you was outside and I was outside just walking? Why did this man have to come snatching me up? Like, I don't feel like I have a choice here. You know, I feel like if I say no, I'm still going to be yes. And if I say yes, well, it's still going to be yes anyways. Samantha's story is not unique. Experts in child trafficking say thousands of American youth are sold for sex each year. More than 2,000 of them are in New York City alone. And while they are legally recognized as domestic sex trafficking victims, they are often treated like criminals. If you look at the difference between how we would uh, traditionally treat a 14-year-old girl from Mexico, from the, from the Ukraine, um, who's found in a brothel at 3 in the morning in Queens, um, under the Trafficking Victims Protection Act, which came out in 2000, she's entitled to services, support. Traditionally, a 14-year-old girl who's found in that same brothel in Queens at 3 in the morning, but she's from Hunts Point or Bed-Stuy or Brownsville, um, is sent to juvenile detention. Under New York State's Safe Harbor Act, that's not supposed to happen. The law, which was passed last year, says child victims of prostitution are supposed to be getting services like safe housing and counseling, not getting handcuffed. But many kids are still falling through the cracks, just as Samantha did more than 10 years ago. Arrested for prostitution seven times, Samantha spent months on Rikers Island before she was 15, leaving her with a permanent criminal record. I was a juvenile, then I was 12, 13, and 14. Born in the Bronx, Samantha ran away from home after being abused by her brother. Over the next six years, eight different pimps made her dance in clubs and pick up customers known as tricks in the Bronx, Queens, Times Square, and Brooklyn. I don't really like this neighborhood. <laughs> This is where I had some of my most traumatic experiences. Like getting robbed at gunpoint by a trick. Her pimp was not sympathetic. He slapped the hell out of me. He told me to go back and make that back an extra. He was the kind of guy to install fear into you, you know? He wants you to be very afraid, very afraid. Seven days a week, Samantha had to make her $2,500 a night quota. It didn't matter if it was 9 o'clock in the morning. It didn't matter if there were people going to church on Sundays. It didn't matter if kids was going to school. I've been out here sometimes from 7, 8 o'clock at night to probably 1 in the afternoon. Samantha said she felt like a prisoner. You can't go nowhere. You Basically what you do is you work, you give him the money, you come home, you sleep. You wake up, you work, you get ready, you go to work, and you do the same thing over and over every day, you know? But after witnessing her pimp stab another girl in the head, Samantha decided she had enough and ran away. That was six years ago. These days, Samantha is studying business and accounting and looking for a job. I'm good, I'm doing good. I'm not where I want to be, 
worked with a criminal record, it's been difficult. So in November last year, I was working at Exacare Home Care. Then they called me and told me that my background check was not good, and they told me that I had to stop working. She is hopeful that a new state law passed last summer will help her move forward. Under the law, sex trafficking victims can have their prostitution-related offenses erased. It could take up to a year for Samantha to prove her case, but she says the time and effort will be worth it. Joining us on set is Teresa Tomasoni. Thanks for joining us, Teresa. Thank you. So, Teresa, how did you get Samantha to tell you her story? Well, I was put in touch with Samantha through GEMS, Girls Educational and Mentoring Services, where I actually used to work as a counselor for young women like Samantha. Um, so when I first sat down with her, I think there was already a certain level of trust and understanding that I was familiar with where she was coming from. I also spent a good amount of time talking with her before we ever started filming about her story, about what she was willing to share on camera. And I, I even asked her one time, why do you want to do this? She said she, if people saw this piece and walked away with a better understanding of what goes on on a daily basis for young women like herself, then it would be worth it. So why is Samantha's story so important? Well, there's a common misconception, I think, that a lot of young women or young people in this situation enter the life or prostitution because it's a choice, by choice. They, they like to have sex or they like the fast money, and it's really not. Um, most young women are lured into the commercial sex industry by pimps who are very good at brainwashing them, telling them they're going to get protection, they're going to have a family while they're in it, it's really not that bad. Um, and many of them are also in Samantha's situation where they were literally kidnapped off the streets and forced into it. And how is Samantha doing today? Is she reunited with her family? She is reunited with her mother, um, and I think that they have, you know, they have their own issues, but they have definitely, they've been trying to resolve those, and her mother has been really supportive in trying to understand her experience in the life and, um, and being there for her. Does Samantha feel safe now? Is she afraid that her pimp might come and find her? I think Samantha feels pretty much safe. Two of her pimps are actually in prison now for pimping. Um, so she's not afraid that those two will necessarily come back at her. But um, she told me that she avoids certain places. Like she didn't want to shoot in Queens, for example. I had wanted to film out there. She, did, she felt very strongly about not going out there because a lot of people know her from her years in the life. And um, if pimps see her, she said she's heard stories of girls being out of the life for a while and then a pimp sees her knowing what she's gone through in the past and kidnaps them. And after hearing Samantha's story, where, where do we go from here? As I mentioned in my piece, there's been a lot of progress made as far as legislation goes um, that is working towards supporting victims of trafficking. I think there, we still have a lot to do and a long ways to go. I think people can s encourage local lawmakers to create and enforce legislation that would um, target the pimps, the traffickers, and the johns, the people that purchase sex from these young women, and, and that would not criminalize the young women so that they, some people like Samantha don't walk away with a criminal record from something that they were really made to do. Thanks for the great story, Teresa. Thank you. In Teresa's report, we saw the dark realities of what pimps do for a living. But movies and television definitely tell a different story. Erica Butler has more. You see them everywhere. Music videos, television shows, and movies. Pimps, players in perhaps the second oldest profession in the world, solicit customers for a prostitute, usually in return for a cut of the cash. The word brings up images of zoot suit wearing inner city men who drive fancy cars paid for by their prostitutes. I think we have seen, particularly in the last five to ten years, a, a real increase in the acceptance of glorifying pimp culture. We saw Hot Out Here for a Pimp win an Oscar. A track from the 2005 movie about a streetwise Memphis pimp trying to abandon his hustler life and realize his dreams in music. Pimp has even become a verb and a positive one at that. We have begun to use that kind of terminology to represent 
fly or cool or sexy or whatever. The new term pimp chic refers to just that. Pimping is no longer reserved for an urban group of gangsters. Everyone from ad agencies to fashion houses use models playing pimps to market their products. Do you know what we call that kind of engineering? Pimping and sexy? Yes. The word pimp first appeared in English around 1600 and became popular in the 1970s with the success of black exploitation films. Movies like The Mac encouraged the everyday use of the word. Lloyd says the men who are street pimps are often low-income minorities coming from a traumatic background themselves. But they are not the ones really running the game. Are those men, again, the ones who are making the real money in the, the sex industry in this country, right? Are they the ones owning strip clubs, owning escort agencies, owning websites that sell? No. It's the younger audience that doesn't understand that side of the business and instead absorb this as entertainment. You know, the MTV generation, we're talking probably like 10-year-olds, 12-year-olds who are getting exposed to this word, which to them, to pimp in this context is to improve, to make better, um, and I think they lose the, the connotation of exploiting women. You know, you see the videos and you see magazines and people glorify it, like if it's something, you know, good and something fun and like if they're making all this money and all these girls around them are happy, when in reality, you know, they don't see all the things that the girls go through. My name is a pimp named Slickback, and I believe I may have misplaced some merchandise at this residence. It really diminishes the role of, of what a pimp really does to a young person, of the fact that they are predatory and they are violent. And Di Donato believes that is where terminology becomes important. The mere act of adding the word chic now changes the connotation. We tend to forget about really the power of words and what effect they can have on, on people's developing consciousness. Consciousness about how words and images impact victims under the reign of real pimps. For 219 West, I'm Erica Butler. We're going to continue now with the effect that pimps have on the women they traffic. Just a few blocks away from here is the Midtown Community Court. Every day, prostitutes appear before judges and are offered alternative sentencing. Courtney Bryan is a former criminal defense attorney who oversees the programs there. Courtney, thank you so much for taking the time to sit with us. Thanks for having me. Thanks. Well, just to start off, what exactly happens in the court? How sure. does it work? Um, so the court opened in 1993, and it's the first community court in the country, actually, and has really served as a model for community courts um, around the city, around the state, and even around the world. And prostitution is, is one of the offenses that we handle. So um, people who are arrested for loitering for the purposes of prostitution, for prostitution, and for soliciting a prostitute are um, arraigned at the Midtown Community Court. And what is this alternative sentencing? Mm -hmm. So um, what Midtown really operates under is a, is a philosophy of combining punishment and help. So certainly holding offenders accountable for criminal behavior, but also recognizing that most of the offenders who come through the court have underlying social service needs. So instead of jail um, or a fine or something like that, um, the court would instead sentence them to one of our on-site social service programs. And now tell me, we just saw a piece about the glamorization of the pimp lifestyle mm -hmm. in movies and television. Does that impact your job at all? There is some kind of glamorization of, of the life and of uh, the pimp himself, mm -hmm. you know, as, as taking care of them or providing them sometimes, you know, with clothes and cars or, you know, that sort of thing. Um, and especially when you're first working with them, they're very protective of, of their pimp and of kind of their, the life. But it's when you dig a little deeper and start challenging um, some of their, you know, assumptions about what healthy relationships are, and you know, then you start to dig a little deeper and realize, and they begin to, I think, realize that this, um, you know, this isn't a healthy dynamic. And how do women who've been and correct me if I'm wrong, mm -hmm. most of them seem to be forced into this lifestyle. Mm -hmm. How do they get out of it if they have... The reality that many of these women are trapped, um, you know, they, just like a domestic violence victim, they're preparing to leave. That's the most dangerous time for them. Um, they don't have 
often the education, job history, family support. I mean, often that's what has gotten them into this in the first place is that they've been throwaway kids, runaway kids, they've been sexually abused by their families, so they don't have the support. And how do you and how do we get them there? Yes. So, <laughs> so that is, that's really the crux of what we're trying to do at the Midtown Community Court with mm -hmm. our, um, our social service programs. And, and I have a great example of a woman who had been arrested over 70 times for, for prostitution. She's about 40 years old. This is somebody who was just coming through the system over and over again. And unfortunately, because of her record, she wasn't getting alternative sanctions. Mm -hmm. um, but there was something that clicked with her on this one particular day where she felt like this was, she was done, you know, this was enough. And fortunately, we had the staff and our judge um, was willing to give her a chance. And instead of sentencing her to jail, she was mandated to a number of, um, of counseling sessions with our program. Now she is, um, she's left her pimp. And then in the end, the court worked with her to get her into shelter. She was able to reunite, get visitation rights with her children, whom she lost contact with for a number of years, um, enroll her in public assistance. And, you know, she's she's not on the streets anymore. She's not working. Well, thank you so much for talking to us. Thank you. And good luck thank with you. everything. We'll be right back. In a couple of days, Congress returns for a lame duck session. On the table will be the Bush era tax cuts. It's the last gasp of this Congress in which Democrats control the House. Political expert Peter Beiner joins us to discuss what will happen during that time and what we can expect once the Republicans take over the House come January. Peter, thank you so much for coming on the show. My pleasure. It's great to see you. Um, let's dive right in. What, how do you think this whole tax cut issue will play out in the next couple of months? I think the Obama administration has to make a decision about whether they're going to compromise or not. I think it's unlikely that the Republicans flush off their victory are going to compromise. Um, there have been some suggestions that Obama might allow all the tax cuts to continue for a couple of years and then say he wants to revisit it. I think that would not make his Democratic base very happy, but it may be that, um, the, that the White House wants to try to provide some kind of fig, fig, you know, fig leaf right here at the beginning. So you're talking about compromise. President Obama said he wants to find common ground. Is that even possible? Can we expect that to happen, or are we facing a possible gridlock? I think we will have mostly gridlock, and, and pretty soon people will start posturing towards the 2012 elections. There may be small areas um, where people can try to find compromise. A lot of it will revolve around the Deficit Commission that reports in December, uh, and, and maybe there will be some elements of what they say that people can try to work on. But in general, I think the big legislative lifting took place already in Obama's first term, uh, first two years. He got a lot done, and he'll get much less done now. And it's interesting you mentioned the 2012 elections, because last time you were on this show, you said that President Obama would prob probably win that election with a landslide. Do you still feel, feel this way now, especially when we have, um, like, Mitch McConnell, who's saying his agenda is to make sure President Obama is a one-term president? Do you think... The president who has a united party behind him is very difficult to beat, and Obama won't have a primary challenge. There's really no one on the, on the landscape who could challenge him inside the Democratic Party. I think the Republican candidates are also not likely to be people who can win the kind of crossover votes they need to. They have to cut into the Hispanic vote, into the youth vote. I don't think any of the potential candidates out there look like they have much chance of doing that. So let's speak Republican candidates. For the new GOP, we have the Tea Party movement that really took off. Who do you think, who do you think could be potentially someone who could lead the GOP in 2012? Well, the front runner is, is Mitt Romney, probably. But conservatives are not wild about Romney, um, partly because of his health care plan in Massachusetts, which I think is too much like Obama's, mm -hmm. partly, frankly, because I think of some kind of anti-Mormon bigotry that exists in the grassroots of the Republican Party. Uh, and um, so I think that there will be probably Romney and someone to his right, someone more conservative. That could be uh, Mike Huckabee. Uh, it could be... Um, uh, it could be Haley Barber. It could be John Thune, the senator from South Dakota. It could be Sarah Palin. The Republican establishment is desperate to try to prevent Sarah Palin from getting the nomination because they think she would lose badly. But uh, in a state like Iowa, the Iowa caucuses, which are dominated by conservative activists, she could do very well. Last time you were on the show, you also said that there is no way that health care reform would ever be dismantled. Do you still feel the same way after the election? 
Yes, even if Republicans could get that through the House, it would never get through the Senate, and Obama would veto it even if it did. So I think Republicans, even if you look at their language now, they're basically promising the Tea Party that they'll make an effort, but they're basically acknowledging it's not going to happen. Great. Well, thank you so much for joining us. I really appreciate thank you. My it. Pleasure. Coming up next, who you're going to call the bed bug busters? And later, an ancient celebration takes root in New York. Bedbugs are invading New York City. They've caused thousands of people to itch and scratch. They've entered homes and concert halls. They've even inspired a musical. Sleep tight. Don't let the bedbugs But bedbugs are no joke. To get rid of them, you just might need help from man's best friend. Meet Champ. He is half of the bedbug sniffing duo that's been in high demand since the epidemic spread throughout the city. Good boy, oh good boy. Champ's trainer and caretaker Danny Camacho says business at M&M &M Environmental has increased several hundred fold. We would get maybe one or two calls in a week. This is five years ago. Now it's not uh, unusual to get 30 to 50 calls a day concerning this problem. Bedbug complaints have steadily risen in the past decade. According to the Department of Housing and Preservation and Development, there were 537 reported complaints in the 2004 fiscal year and 12,768 in 2010. Brooklyn has the highest rates out of the five boroughs. Experts attribute the rise to various factors. There are issues in regard to uh, pesticide resistance, uh, people were just not accustomed to it, they didn't know to look for it, uh, and it just really increased. A lot of the research for this insect stopped around the 1940s and 50s. You know, we had to relearn, and we're still relearning. Mm -hmm. Milana knows firsthand how it feels. She lives with her mother, two daughters, and niece and nephew in an apartment in East Harlem. She's been dealing with bed bugs for three months. Um, it's draining. It's very draining. Every day you have to look for bugs. Milana's apartment was treated twice already, but the bugs are still present. She's had to throw away many of her belongings as a result. It's like starting your whole life all over again, and then you don't know what to expect next. Bedbugs have hit several iconic places in the city over the past several months, including the AMC movie theater in Times Square, Carnegie Hall, Lincoln Center, and now it's even become an international issue here at the UN. Experts aren't sure when the epidemic might end. Bed bug sniffing dogs like Champ undergo extensive training to recognize the pests. Beagles um, characteristically have uh, good olfactory senses. You know, I, I think they're used for a number of, of de as detection dogs. Vials of live bed bugs are hidden in secret locations. Champ is then put to the test continually throughout the day to ensure he can detect the bugs. And the command is, find your bees. And now he knows he's on task, and he's, he starts sniffing up and down the different cracks and crevices under the doors, under the door saddles, the sofas. And when he picks up the live bed bug scent, then he raises his paw and taps the area. After the bed bugs are found, the affected areas are treated by heaters at temperatures over 113 degrees or by freezing and using pesticides. Detection by beagles is 98 percent effective. The amount of time that it takes for a human element to search out for a visual sign may take many hours, many manpower hours, to visually uh, dismantle the mattress, the bed frame, furniture, and may not be fortunate to find a live bed bug or viable eggs. With the canine, in a few minutes, when the dog is asked to search out a room or the area, just a few minutes, the dog can detect it quickly. As far as experts know, bed bugs do not carry disease. Fortunately, uh, bed bugs are not vectors of, of any disease. Uh, according to CDC, Center for Disease Control, and other uh, you know, research groups as well. Uh, and that includes either direct transmission, which is when the insect bites you, nor through mechanical transmission, which would be if you squash the insect on you. Even so, anyone who is bitten by a bed bug knows how uncomfortable it is. 
This is a problem that will not go away anytime soon. But with the help of the canine world, people like Milana will be able to keep it under control. For 219 West, I'm Melissa Rose Cooper. Wow. I wish my dog could do that. I hope your dog never has to do that. <laughs> right. Well, in the first week of November, a very important religious holiday was observed. Chances are you've never heard of it. The holiday commemorates the rebuilding of the temple in Jerusalem and the giving of the Torah to the Israelites. It's been celebrated in Ethiopia for thousands of years, but this year it came all the way to the 92nd Street Y. Dana Rappaport was there. The Sigd holiday, a holiday celebrated by generations of Ethiopian Jews. This year, celebrants and guests have come from Israel, North America, and Canada to the Upper East Side of Manhattan. Ethiopia is a culture uh, that has a deep uh, connection with ancient Israel. The roots of even the non-Jews of Ethiopia uh, goes back to biblical times. But the Jews of Ethiopia represent the existence of an old, strong Jewish community that also left an indelible uh, stamp on Ethiopian culture. And this culture has been preserved through thousands of years. First in Ethiopia, in the 20th century it was celebrated in Israel, and now also in New York, where 500 Ethiopian Jews established a small community. Two years ago, the larger Ethiopian community, the one in Israel, was given a real sign of support when the parliament voted it a national holiday. The boost was well deserved, 20 some years after more than 30,000 Ethiopian Jews were brought to Israel. In Ethiopia, people have to travel weeks because no, they don't, people walk place to place. Some of the people have to three, four days walk in to get to the Sigd uh, town. Getting to New York's Sigd festival wasn't a problem. What remains a challenge is getting people to be aware of black Jews in general. Many are still not familiar with their existence, even though they have been practicing Orthodox Judaism for over 3,000 years. Here, people they don't know Jewish coming from all over the world. Indian Jewish, Yemenite Jewish, um, from all over Moroccan Jews. So people they don't know, only they think European Jews. So if you don't look like European, they don't think you Jewish. One way to expose people to their culture was to bring the Beta dance troupe from Israel to New York. Their dance tell the story of the journey from Africa to Israel through the traditional Ethiopian Eskesta shoulder dance. This is something that is genetic, inherited, hereditary. I saw it since I was born, in every occasion, in every event, happy or sad. There's always movement, really. This is what's beautiful about it. Something is always happening, the body is always speaking. So it's from home. Home for Ezekias, the first Israeli-Ethiopian professional dancer, is Ethiopia. But he left when he was one year old, in 1984. Many of the kids who came then are now in their 20s and 30s, and like thousands of their native Israeli peers, decided to try and form a new home in New York. With the help of Mulu and other Ethiopian organizations in the city, the Ethiopian Jewish community is getting exposed little by little. The sixth festival of the Sigd in New York to commemorate the rebuilding of the temple may help not only reconnect to their roots, but also to build better bonds between the community and New Yorkers. For 219 West, I am Dana Rappaport. That's it for this month's edition of 219 West from the CUNY Graduate School of Journalism. Thanks for watching. I'm Walter Smith Randolph. And I'm Jessica Kordemosh. We'll be back next month with more stories from the five boroughs. In the meantime, make sure to check out our podcast on iTunes. From everyone here at 219 West, take care.